This is the Amadon Planet Podcast, episode 38. I'm your host, Joel Amadon. Thank you for joining me on this never-ending quest to figure out how to teach better. Today on the podcast is my friend and longtime educator, Shane Bean. He's an assistant principal at Sauk Prairie High School. He is a scholar, uh, someone I can always lean on, and he has been uh, willing to come on this podcast with me. It's been a long time. I've been trying to get him on for a long time. We have some books, a stack of books that we want to talk about. But first, I thought we would continue with another episode in the Reflect Strand, which he started way back at the beginning of the uh, global pandemic when kind of had some time, some time to think back. And we had a, a, an episode where I talked with my grad assistant over the past year, who's continued this year. Maybe interesting to have her back on again, as we've done our second year, uh, our second semester in a pandemic, but that's for another episode for another day. And we also had Brian DeSalvo, a former student and current math teacher in Wisconsin. But now we get to talk with Shane and Shane is my, I don't know, oldest teaching friend, I guess. We started full-time teaching together at Sockbury High School in the fall of 2002. We were both teaching the same subjects, but uh, he's got more of a story than that. And, and with a lot of kids, a lot of time, and a lot of years in education uh, later, uh, we've, we've grown a lot together and a lot of conversations. So we thought we'd share one with you on the podcast today. Shane, thank you for uh, coming on the podcast. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Joel. All right. So a uh, little bit background on you, if you would go for it and share a little bit. I mean, I know all about you. Well, I don't know all about you, Shane. Every time you, you surprise me every now and then. But uh, if you could share a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, uh, first, let me test you, Joel. What would be my claim to fame? What, uh, what TV show have I appeared on? Oh, I know this. The Bozo Show. The Bozo Show is correct. What game was I on? The grand prize game. You almost said it like the announcer did there as well. So good work. I, for those that, of you who, that, for those of you like, who are dated and don't know what the grand prize game is, uh, it was the corniest uh, show uh, on this low budget uh, uh, clown show. Uh, back in the <laughs> 70s and 80s. Literally a clown show. Literally, yeah. Jane was literally on a clown show. Oh my goodness. <laughs> So, but it, how wide was that? Like, was it? It was. I mean, from it was. A, it was on WGN. Yeah, uh, the Superstation. So, yeah, the Superstation. So you know, at that time, from South Dakota, Montana <laughs> to <laughs> the uh, big time, Michigan, you know, Midwest, Midwesterny. Uh, that it was. It was a big show. So, and and I will say it because my mother put in for the tickets to go on this show um, when when she was pregnant with me. And we didn't receive the tickets till sixth grade when I was in sixth grade. Wow. So that's how popular the, the yeah, line yeah. for tickets were. So it was a big deal at that time. Okay, trivia back at you. Okay, so you played the game, which was you'd, you'd, you'd throw a ping pong ball, I think, ping pong ball? Ping pong ball, yeah. Into yep. cups that were spread out, okay? Yep. And uh, so if you got in the first one, you'd get prizes all the way to the end. And what was the what was the grand prize in the grand prize game? I think I remember. Let me see. You go, yeah, the, Shane. The grand, the grand prize was a fifty-dollar bill. Crisp. That you would, crisp. A, a crisp. Yes, thank you. A crisp, and he'd snap it. Fifty-dollar yeah. bill and a new uh, Schwinn bike. Schwinn uh, bike. Yeah. Oh my goodness! I thought Schwinn's were the the greatest bicycle ever because of that exactly. Thing. That was the brand. That was it. So. Yeah. Yeah, and the Bozo Show. You'd watch like cartoon. He'd have cartoons. I remember that's like you'd have GI Joe and like snippets mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I love the grand prize. Oh, yeah. All right. So we have already gone off onto a tangent. But sorry, go, go Shane. You're, you've already started us off on a on a wild direction. This is great. This is wonderful. Yeah. Uh, no, thanks. Uh, I we uh, was fortunate to grow up on a small dairy farm, uh, 600 acres in uh, rural Wisconsin, uh, just a, a beautiful neck of the woods um, uh, by by Baraboo, Madison, Wisconsin area. And um, and grew up uh, without really a focus on education. Um, but uh, um, my parents created space uh, for me within the work on the farm and those kind of things to pursue interest. And so um, they nurtured my love of reading uh, and continually provided opportunities um, uh, to learn. And uh, so enjoyed that. Some significant teachers along the way, uh, as, as I think we all do, that impacted in life. Um, 
I went to a school that there was 13 people in my class, K through six. Uh, and so then to go to the, to go to town, to go to the big school where there was 200 kids in a grade. Um, yeah, it was, <laughs> was, was quite a, quite a change. Uh, and enjoyed that opportunity, got fully involved in high school. Uh, again, parents allowed uh, just uh, to do sports, to do clubs, to do forensics, to do all those kind of things. And, and you could just kind of see rounding out as a person. Um, then towards uh, senior year, um, my grades uh, were good. My test scores were good and uh, had the opportunity to, um, to finish well in my class and ended up with the opportunity to go to Vanderbilt University in Nashville. And I know for your, your followers down there that this is a conference rival. And uh, I'm proud to announce that we did win a championship yesterday. Uh, we won oh. the, the women's soccer championship. Our first nice. Time. There uh, you go. So. At, at Vanderbilt, we celebrate bowling championships. We celebrate uh, uh, tennis. We, you know, we're not going to win a football. They've had baseball. Year. They've had some baseball. Our baseball team is incredible. We, you know, so. I have to be uh, very careful because my boss went to Vanderbilt, uh, Dean Rock. So ho- mm-hmm. shout out to Vandy if you're listening out there, Dean Rock. All right. Good work. Um, and so, again, I, I consider the transition from um, uh, from a 13-person farm uh, uh, country school to the town at that time, a 200 person school, and then to go from Little Spring Green, uh, Plain, Wisconsin, to uh, Nashville, Tennessee, in the heart of that. Um, and uh, just walking on campus that first time and asking myself, what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> because it, it clearly became clear, or clearly became evident that I was the token uh, farm rural kid in this class to help round out their, their class. Um, and uh, the first semester really kicked my butt. And uh, then I learned how to learn how to learn differently in college and uh, and thrived in that atmosphere. And again, could just see opportunity after opportunity rise um, for myself there. Got to participate in, in cross country all four years, got to travel and see some some great things that, again, that that this this small town kid never expected the opportunity to do. Um, uh, enjoyed the had some great professors in college that just uh, sparked interest and sparked conversation. Um, and enjoy that piece. And in my sophomore year, um, they made you pick a major. And, and so I was good at math. So I picked math. And then at the end of that year, I realized, hmm, what am I going to do with math? Uh, I'm paying an awful lot of money uh, to be here. I better pick up a second degree. And so I picked up an education degree. And uh, in a school like Vanderbilt, not many people go there to be math teachers. So mm-hmm. there was three people in my, in my program, in my cohort. Um, that we went through. And, uh, and uh, during my senior year then, as I'm doing student teaching, uh, a company reached out to do some interviews. Again, my grade point and my test scores and all those good things were there were good. And I thought I'd do some interviews for before the teaching interview cycle started up. And, um, and uh, I didn't even know what the company did, but they offered me a job offer. And it was, you know, three times more than what a beginning teacher uh, would make. And so I looked uh, using my math skills and saw my student loan <laughs> opportunities and, and saw what they're going to pay. And, uh, and so while I was student teaching, I took a non-education job and uh, had the opportunity to work for a large consulting firm and, uh, and traveled all around the country and uh, South America. Um, again, just using some computer programming, uh, becoming a, a tester was my specialty in telecommunications and uh, set up the first uh, cellular network in Brazil, um, which was a really cool opportunity um, and, and just really got to experience more of the world. So I see this progression in my life of, of going from, 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 from opportunity to opportunity and then um, got married and the traveling life was harder and um, and then uh, had the opportunity to take a sabbatical um, from work and, and was back on the farm. And my wife was preparing to graduate from, from physical therapy school and 9-11 happened. Um, and that really threw your focus back into a, a mm. different ray of light. And so on the sabbatical, a, uh, a long-term sub job opened up at the local high school where I graduated from. And they called me and said, we don't have anybody. Uh, uh, can you do this while you're here? I said, sure, and uh, uh, enjoyed it uh, immensely and realized that I didn't want to work with computers anymore. I wanted to work with people and uh, was offered a full-time position starting the next fall uh, alongside a 
uh, young punk uh, directly <laughs> out of hauling beer at uh, at a local festival uh, in Milwaukee, and the rest is history. That is true. Yes, got called for my interview when I was uh, working at Summerfest bartending, and yeah, like, hey, you got to go get an interview. I'm like, all right, haven't slept much in three days, and let's go, let's do it. Oh my goodness. I'm just like thinking about all the different parallels, Shane. I don't even know if we've talked about this before. Like just um, the you know computer, like I was going to be a computer science major. Did you know that? I did know that. Amongst your list of eight majors. You're- yeah, yeah. I had many majors. It took me a while to uh, decide. And, and same, similar to me, like I graduated with 83. You graduated with like a double the size. Like you, you were at the big school. <laughs> And so like going to Madison was like eye open. I mean, so like, like these eye opening experiences, ex- except I didn't get a chance to, you know, create uh, cellular networks in Brazil and stuff like that. But I mean, having those sorts of things, but then also too, the job that opened up for you to do the short time substitution, I think is the job then that I walked into. So you took on, like, I think they had two openings that year. Well, obviously they had two openings. So, you know, we had the similar sort of connection there. Like that's, mm-hmm unreal all that and just and then i came to that same realization doing some internship stuff uh with a company up in wisconsin where we weren't really doing computer science stuff it was working on a manufacturing thing for computers but i thought this is computer science which shows you how educated i was but like i was like i want to work with people and like you know and having that sort of realization but then took me a little while longer to actually get to that point of (laughs) graduating so maybe i did wander a little bit how many years how many years did it take you to graduate it only took five and a half years shane so it's a super duper senior um experience and then yeah it took me four and a half to get a phd so there's a a little bit of math there so i think i was paying more for that that (laughs) part side of it all right. So we had a little bit of background on you. So our relationship. So yes, you walked us all the way up to when we started work together. And and yeah, I was, you were someone with worldly experience, worldly experience. And I, and I was actually still in school. I was doing a little known program, internship program that I was, cause I was engaged in, you know, and to graduate from a teaching program in December was kind of a tough position to be put in. And so having that sort of, you know, Hey, I have this semester. So I started applying to places like I I had already graduated and was like, Hey, you can try me out for a semester. There's this internship program that you have to jump through some hoops for, but if you do, I can come and be, you know, fill a position. And I think Sock Prairie and some of the leadership there, they thought, Hey, let's take a risk on this guy. Cause I think, you know, they kind of had, maybe it was a last minute opening or I don't know how it came. It must've been a last minute. Cause it was really late in the summer when I got a call. So, you know, Hey, let's take a risk on this kid versus, you know, someone that hasn't gotten a job yet. And here we go. There we go. So we're, we're together. We're, we're going to be new teachers, uh, full-time teachers together. And that's where it started. And we, we taught the same class, which was kind of, kind of an interesting class. It wasn't your traditional like freshman level math class. Mm-hmm. It was, core plus which was kind of an interesting math course i don't know if you want to give a background you want me to yeah why don't you give a background on the on the on the curriculum and and i'll give a background on the on the setting we were in yeah so it was i mean so like you know traditional math class is more of a um hey we're gonna do one of our strands so it's like algebra or something like that where you're gonna go through an entire algebra course and that's gonna be a similar pattern of hey we're gonna turn the page of the textbook. We're going to show some examples uh, or, or no, we're going to go through the night's previous night's homework. Then we're going to go into the new stuff where we turn the page of, of the textbook. We're going to show some examples. Maybe some kids will do some examples um, together. Then we're going to assign, you know, 30 problems, do the odds and the answers are in the back of the book. Right. And that's, that was like a traditional, that was a kind of the math class I grew up with. And um, kind of a traditional, and you still see that some places uh, around. But then this was different in the fact that it was like the, the philosophy was, what's, if you're going to take one more math class, what math do you need to know? So you don't, ne- yes, you need to know algebra, but you don't need to know just algebra. So they thought, hey, let's, Core Plus was built on, we're going to do some algebra, we're going to do geometry, we're going to do statistics and probability, and we're going to do discrete and we're going to put all those into one and then it's just called integrated mathematics. And so, and it would did a lot of things in group work, which was 
it, it kind of blew my mind because I was like, what do I do? <laughs> what do I do with it? Like, so it was a completely new way of teaching. So I got shoved off my, I mean, for me personally, I was like, I got this huge shove and I was like, what does this actually look like? And you were a little bit ahead because you had a chance to do the, the long-term substitute, but it was still was like, I didn't really understand how this was going to work. How was I going to teach with groups? Because it wasn't me up front. It wasn't teacher centered, which was I know it was probably what my program at the University of Wisconsin, a fine public institution, uh, would was promoting, but I still hadn't seen it yet. What would have been ranked higher at that time, by the way, Vanderbilt or UW? I'm pretty sure uh, Madison uh, was rocking it at that day. I, I did look up uh, Paul Cobb, who was a uh, superstar in uh, at Vanderbilt, uh, and still he's a emeritus professor now. But he was he just got there, right? Because when did, when did you show up in Vanderbilt? Uh, 92 92 ooh. so Paul Cobb was there in 93 I believe and so I because I've read some of his stuff and I was doing the doctoral work but he's kind of an amazing guy at so there you go but Wisconsin had some superstars as well so I think they were they were they were neck and neck uh up at the top of the uh math ed world <laughs> so anyway what um so like I mean that was it, it was kind of mind-blowing about hey how do how does this work how does this teaching with groups and really like letting students struggle with problems, which is actually what we, you know, what we're striving for. We want productive struggle for our students with mathematics, but we've talked about that in previous episodes of the podcast, so like celebrating the struggle with Anne Monroe and Candy's cook and stuff like that. But it was like, it was being thrown into a fire and it was, I, it was kind of sh shook me. I'm like, what does this look like to teach like this? Yeah, and, and, and for me, um, you talk about that. I'm, I'm now watching teachers that I had a decade ago in that traditional format that you described running classrooms completely different mm. um, than what I had, had grown up with. And so that was, you know, I'd had that opportunity before you to, to, to watch that, but I hadn't had that chance to develop that culture within the classroom. And, and how, do you, how do you handle all the noise and the chaos? Um, yeah you know, from, from these old school teachers that I was used to that threw erasers at you and all those kind of things when you fell asleep. So, so watch that transformation and to, to live it um, was really interesting. But we were in the middle of the math wars at, at that time. Oh, yeah. That was certainly the case at Sauk Prairie as well. Um, and, and for me, coming from a business consulting background where we came in and we had to learn problems and we had to apply and find unique situations, this fit right into that mindset for me of, of this program, um, but something that, that, you know, being new and that pendulum really swinging in that other direction, um, I, the, the uh, um, community just struggled uh, with that. And, and even colleges really struggled with this, this way of looking at math and are they prepared? You know, you know at that time, particularly math was a gatekeeper mm -hmm. and, and you needed to get them to a certain point. Was this going to get them there? Were they going to, when, you, when a college looked at the transcript and saw integrated math, what did that mean to them? Right. And that was causing, you know, struggles. And, and for parents um, who had gone, gone, gone through school in that traditional spot, who not only had, had goals for their children, but also had highly preconceived notions about math, that math is hard or math should be hard, um, this was a difficult switch and we walked right into the middle of that. Yeah. And then I think in our, at least, yeah. And I think our second or third year is when we started piloting the new, newer, um, we, we were, I think we were a leader in Wisconsin for implementation. And so like the next book came out. And so Shane and I have our names in some uh, textbooks for the, the second iteration where we had a chance to, go through and read the books and uh, implement the activities and provide feedback to authors who in hindsight, I didn't realize how cool that was. Like when I go into my, do my doctoral work and I'm reading papers, I'm like, Hey, I know this guy. <laughs> I know this guy It's like, that was pretty cool. Like that uh, we had a chance to kind of get in and see how the sausage is made with uh, writing textbooks and seeing some opinions on things where, and, you know, and, and they were with the second book, I think they were, you know, speaking to those, sort of tensions that existed within the curriculum, like, hey, we see it as if we wanted to be extreme, this is actually what we would want, but we have to appease to people. So they're putting in some practice, they're putting in some stuff and, and being able to see in some of our teaching, I think like, and, and this was the eye opening experience for me when I realized like, there's something to this, 
when we were doing some of the stuff that we did all the time, like, you know, uh, foil or uh, expanding and factoring and all this sort of stuff that was like, I don't know, kind of a heavy topic in our, uh, the curriculum that I had growing up and, in, in, you know, in like early algebra classes. And we would, I would give that to my students. So they'd been doing like really in context problems, like, you know, talking about, you know, the prom and what best place to start, you know, to sell tickets, to maximize profit and kids are struggling with that. And then all of a sudden, you know, so that was using quadratic functions and then doing this, these, uh, like what we called naked math problems where they're doing some factoring and expanding and kids are just flying through it. They're like, can we do this all the time? This is really easy. I'm like, yeah, it is compared to like struggling with this in context problem. And then they're doing this, you know, factoring and expanding like this is, can we, we just do this is, I mean, really seriously, this is, this is what you did. And like, yeah, that's what we did. And like seeing that sort of, you know, eye opening experience of like, Hey, this, this thing that I struggled with and I saw all my friends struggle with was something that these kids, like even the kids that you would say, you know, in parentheses in quotations struggled, like we're flying through. It was, it was kind of, it was pretty eye opening to have that sort of, um, experience. So I don't know. It, that was something that really opened me up to like, Hey, what's the, what's the possibilities here? So would you have said, Joel, cause that was a unique opportunity for us, uh, was that your opening thought into pursuing higher education um, as a as a vocation? Well, it opened like I could. So, like, what I didn't understand uh, the good. I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little. We're, we're gonna be a lot of tangential stuff. So I'm, I will answer the question. But when I thought of teaching math, I thought of I, if I could come up with the ultimate explanation. Like initially, when I thought about teaching, if I could come up with the best explanation for how to do something, like me personally, if I could explain it, you know, person in front, speaking to everybody, once I have that unlocked, then it's just, let's play the hits every year, right? It's going through, it's, and I saw like my teachers with their file cabinets, with it's like these worksheets for this time, and I'm going to create the perfect scenario. And it's going to be, I'm going to perfect this course where it's just going to be your, you know, behaviorist, really behaviorist. Like I'm going to give you this stimulus. You're going to respond appropriately. And I'm going to keep going. Everyone's going to ace my class. I'm going to be beautiful. And then I'm going to coach football for 30 years and everything. You know, that was the plan, right? Perfect. You know, and, uh, and, you know, and that was like my initial thought was I'm going to perfect this teaching perfect, you know, it, be the, be the sports coach. Cause I love coaching sports and that was going to be it. And then this, way of thinking about teaching math it was like the unsolvable problem the ever-changing unsolvable problem with so many variables because now those it's not just people listening it's like they're talking but they're not even talking to me they're talking to each other and it's like it was so complex and thinking about and then um you know like i said before like maybe my program at madison was trying to prepare me for what this could be and I think they did because they had their own curriculum called Mathematics and Context, which did similar stuff. Um, one of the 13 NSF funded curriculum, Math and Context is one, Core Plus was another. There's a bunch of other ones, but um, I digress. But anyway, like my, my, my training like started making sense. And then I did my master's program and it was like, oh, it was like my master's program was at Wisconsin too. Cause you know, when you, you had the best, you might as well keep going back, you know? And so then it added to it and it made more sense of like, Oh, like it was like taking all the stuff I already already learned to the next level. And I got to apply it directly. And like, this is awesome. And like seeing like my class as like a lab and trying to adjust and again, trying to perfect, but it wasn't like perfecting my stuff. It was like perfecting environments, like trying to create the best environments for the interactions that we wanted to happen. And that really changed my ideas about teaching and then thinking about how do we, how do we help people get to this point, right? To, and so that I think, and along with a, a, an elbow from one of my instructors in my master's program, um, well, a couple of them uh, sent me to uh, wanting to pursue a PhD, but it was like it, it, the complete change about what is this thing called teaching? Like it wasn't, up front, me stage on the stage. It was the guide on the side. It was a facilitator. It was a creator of environments. So yeah, that was that was a kind of a, an eye-opening, like uh, paradigm, whatever, shaking. I don't know. 
kind of, I went to the matrix. There we go. That, that's probably the best metaphor right there. I took the pill. What about you? I mean, like when you think about just the, the differences and cause I'm, I mean, I'm sure when you went through sock prairie back in the seventies, like <laughs> okay, Shane is not that old. Um, <laughs> But that's a common joke amongst us. It makes him laugh. Anyway, so like Shane, like I'm sure you didn't, that change happened while you were in college in a way around the world. So like when you came back and you thought like, hey, what, what, is, what, what does it mean to teach math? Like did, did Vanderbilt prepare you for this? Or were you like, hey, this, I'm ready for this? No, I wasn't. I wasn't ready for it because it was, it, I was ready for the math portion of it. But this is about thinking about how to think um yeah this is about this is about collaboration this is about learning not you know when you talked about the naked math how, how that's easy for some kids that that's not what this was about this was about discovering developing um uh, working through proofs in a more natural fashion not just the, the, the bare proofs of geometry that we do and really exploring how was the pythagorean theorem developed how was the law of cosines and sines? How do they interact with each oh, other? Yeah. Um, you know, there were there were certain units that were outstanding. Distance were really, formula, Pythagorean theory. Yeah, yeah, those, those yeah. Are, yeah, 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 yeah. That 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 particularly, and even in education as a whole, um, when 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 I went through school slightly before you did, that's not what we did, right? We learned mm -hmm. facts and figures. We learned the fifty state capitals. We we did those things, um, and I was really good at that. I could, you know, spell, I could multiply in my head. I could do that kind of stuff. And, and then to go to college and then go to this workplace where, okay, you have those abilities. You have, you have to be able to work with others uh, in new environments. You have to be able to communicate yet. We didn't do that in math. Right. And mm -hmm. so to think about doing that and learning that in math was a, was a paradigm changing experience. Um, and so and and for some people, it was too much. It was too much of a swing um, to that side. Yeah, I always felt like, though, if I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody about it, you, you know, and you talked about some of the things with parents and, like, the the real concerns, like, with, hey, is this recognized? This looks way different than what I – because, like, the path that I went on to get to my successful position, like, I know that path. That path works. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but did it work for everybody? And then – so it's like there's – and, and would you want all algebra? Don't you think knowing some discrete, knowing some statistics and probability and seeing those connections between would be helpful? And like, I know for me, and especially I was in like my doctoral work and I was going back and like doing some statistics in my doctoral work, doctoral level, like graduate level stats courses. I'm like, I taught this stuff in sophomore yeah. year. It was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. It was pretty cool. And so, I don't know, there's some things out there and thinking about, you know, some of the standards for mathematical practice that exist out there uh, for like make sense of problems and persevere in solving them using tools strategically. Some of these like things attend to precision and, and even like what Shane was saying, like making proofs in non-traditional ways. Like one of the proofs would be, what is the best price to set for the prom tickets given this function? And it's like that have to come up with a convincing argument, not only convince yourself, but to convince your group, like, hey, this is the right answer. How do we know? How can we see it in a graph table? How can we see it in the equation? So I don't know, all sorts of cool things that we got to do. But there's one thing, Shane, that I think we're talking about collaboration within the classroom. I think what was cool about us and then maybe like what, uh, you know, kind of lends us to this conversation in our friendship is like there was not only collaboration that was encouraged within the classroom, but between classrooms, which was, again, something, a level of planning and interaction amongst teachers that, I think set me up for success going forward. And it's like, we had weekly meetings where we sat and planned, like, what are we going to do? How are we, where are we at? How are we going to proceed? What are the problems? Like that, that was kind of you get, and I wondered, did, was there any connection between that and some of your experiences in the uh, private sector? Did you have that sort of like team sort of management there? Yeah, again, right. It, it paralleled nicely for me because I was used to a very collaborative environment where, you know, there you have a client and you have to meet their needs. In education, our client is our kids and our families and, and, and how do you meet their needs? And so often, right, and it, I mean, there are some eye-opening experiences for me and as a new teacher um, in the 
coming off of different circumstance at 26 or 27. And, and uh, on a lunch, I was on a supervision and I didn't have any kids to supervise. And so I thought, hey, I'd like to go in and watch a couple of teachers. And I remember walking into a, a teacher's room that had been a successful teacher for 25 years. I had had the person, we were friends, they had coached me, they knew me, there was no reason to be intimidated by me. And they froze up when hmm. I walked into that classroom, right? Because we, we owned our classroom and adults didn't come in there. Yeah. And even other teachers didn't come into, and particularly multidisciplinary, we didn't go into other disciplines to see what they were doing. But I knew from students and I knew from my own experience that he had things that I needed to learn and grow as a teacher and I had time. Why not? Right. And so we, you know, with the PLC trend uh, or, or movement that, that DeFore and others started, um, you know, really around that time, um, we weren't in that. We weren't asking the four essential questions, but we were on a step towards that with the collaboration, with classrooms being in the same place, with you know, that idea of, of what, what is working for you and what didn't work for you. Um, we were, we were heading down that path. And again, that was more similar to what was happening outside of the world, outside and, and really starting to move in the business arena at that time. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, those, those meetings, I remember, you know, sometimes they were like, Oh man, I can't believe we got these, all these meetings and trying to, you know, talk to my significant other. I'm sure you're, yeah. yeah. Talk to your wife. Like, Hey, I got these meetings after school. It's going to be a little bit later, but yeah. I mean, Especially because our, our colleagues in other departments weren't doing that. Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. But then like knowing like in hindsight, like all the preparation, all the, you know, planning, all the interactions led to, you know, being able to pers persevere over these problems that I was having in my own practice where you have people that bounce things off people with different experience. Oh, here's something you could do there. Or here's the practices that we're doing. And it was such a helpful. And so that was in like in a formal way, but then informally there was the hallway between your room and my room, which I think we, we treaded uh, a lot uh, back and forth. I think me more than you, because like, I, I would always, I, I was like the eager beaver wanting to come and share something or something like that. And, uh, and I was and also I was also closer to the bathrooms and the fridge. So yeah, there yeah. More <laughs> that way. Yeah, you got to check that teacher's line in case somebody put a plate of something out. Or, or also Shane did have pop tarts in his uh, in his drawer uh, in case I needed a snack. Which at that time I was snacking <laughs> a lot, like a lot. Uh, shout out to pop tarts. Anyway, um, so like what? Are, so we had a lot of interactions. We, we, I mean, in we're kind of in the same space. We're trying to figure this thing out together. And we're doing some certain things. So like one thing I did want to come up with was what are some learnings that we had from each other? Because I think that is something that as much as you can say, like to find, and, and I've, I actually found a term for this is a duo. Like there's this research around duos. And I, I wish I could find that article, but it's like having duos where you can, it's that person to bounce someone off, some things off of each other. I have uh, Dr. Monroe at, uh, at the Ole Miss School of Education. She's someone that's been on the podcast a number of times. She's my person that if, hey, if we have something, we've done a number of projects together that we bounce things off. But that's first started with you, Shane, is like we would, we would I think, bounce these things off of each other all the time. And so we had some learnings. What are some learnings that, that you had? I, I can go first if you want, or do you want to, you got one ready to go? Uh, let, me, let me just comment on that. I hadn't heard that term of duo. But that's something that I've talked about here now as an assistant principal in this role, as we hire and as we set up mentors and as those type of things is who can, who can start off with this person and that relationship may not develop, but can be some of those things at the beginning, but then really to, to encourage and to put, to, to put people in situations where that growth and that relationship can happen mm -hmm. and really see that growth as a person and as an educator. So. Uh, yeah, I'd be curious to hear yours. Why don't you go first? I've got. I've got oh, well, let me push back on that too. And I don't think that necessarily has to be someone in the same discipline too. Because I remember there was somebody right. just because uh, our patterns of showing up at school at the same time, George Roth mm -hmm. back in the day, he's someone that taught me about rubrics. And I still think about it to this day and like was someone that I could bounce some things off as we were sitting there making coffee. It's like, who could race there and get to make coffee first? So uh, that was just something that happened organically. But yeah, having those uh, duos is great. So sorry, you wanted me to go first? Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, Shane taught me that slow and steady can still win the race is because uh, I think at uh, at times, thinking about how to proceed 
and, and maybe this is something that he, I, he's going to say about me is like, I would be someone that's like scrambling, like doing all sorts of things and having like, Ooh, three minutes before class, I want to try something and like copy something off or set something up like, Hey, he, let's do something to the environment to make something happen. And, you know, I would always like, you know, maybe run and bounce something off Shane and Shane would just listen and he maybe offer a comment or offer something where he's like, he wasn't going to do what I was going to do, but he had some questions. He had some ponderings. And then maybe later he would put something into play, but it just, it's showing like, I mean, I think we still were progressing at the same time, but maybe like mine was a more erratic stock market and Shane was more of a, you know, steady going sort of way. And so I, I think they just showed me like these, these like subtle, subtle changes are, are something and subtle um, things to do with your practice are, are good and are good to do and probably not as jarring maybe to the students uh, at the same time. So that was something that I guess stood out to me from you, Shane, because yeah, like never no. really willing to go like just the, not willing, but like always meth- methodical being methodical. And, and, that, and that was honestly my first thing that I wrote down was that, that corresponding piece is the willingness to try new things. Um, yeah, to talk about that hallway uh, and to say that was a good intro to this conversation because you would run down, yeah, right before class when we had the same class going to start. I'm doing this. You should do this. And you, you would be willing to throw five new things against the wall and just see what stuck, see what worked. And, and that wasn't my style. And I could ask those questions. But I can point to several things that I implemented that I learned from you and I learned from, from your successes and from your failures of what didn't work. And I needed that in my life because otherwise that slow was going to go to a crawl and I wasn't going to grow. And so you accelerated that. Um, and I really appreciate your willingness and, 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 and just freedom and creativity uh, to see a need and try to fill it. Um, and if it didn't work, to admit that and come back the next day and try to fill it a different way, uh, which might have been my way, and might be, and might be another new way. Yeah, and I think the what's happened, and which is great now, like I'm finding the rhythm of being in a semester schedule allows me to say, like, all right, I've got a semester experiment, right? Let's make some adjustments. Let's take something, and so even some of the things that I was doing back at Sock Prairie, like using base groups, I still use them, and now it's like this, you know, version fourteen point two of base groups, which are longstanding groups that students always meet. And I use them because I think that they're a nice thing that creates some consistency and some social, you know, connections, but like those started in with, within soccer Prairie high school and like thinking about how to make them better. And like, I know that there's been many conversations I had with you like, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this with them. I think I'm about doing this with them and having those like experiments, being able to do something for a, either if it's for a semester or for uh, the last few months of the year, which I think is an underrated time like for that or uh, an underutilized time is like when it gets like stale towards the end of a, a year, not that it was last year, but <laughs> to try new things, which we had a big chance to do this past, uh, this past year. Um, what's, what's something else you had, Shane? Um, another thing that you influenced me is your mindset towards assessments and uh, your, your willingness to call them celebrations or your, your piece on that. And, you know, celebrate good times, uh, just all those pieces. <laughs> But really, really underneath all of the, the goofy stuff, all of those pieces was a mindset and how you looked at it. And, and that was crucial. And I still to that, I mean, that's something that will never change for me is when somebody calls it a test, I will often either hear you in my head or I'll call it a celebration, particularly with my own children and with students. Oh, you're celebrating, you know, but just that idea of not regurgitating thinking, but showing what you have learned and let's celebrate that and we'll celebrate what, we, what you don't know and the opportunity then to grow from that and, and, and reframing how we look at assessments, whether they're formal in, in here or really in life, those opportunities that come before us. So I appreciate you teaching me and, and affecting my mindset on that. Well, that's a, a, you know, just to bounce back on that. I think, you know, we did some, uh, you're, you're very good at analysis and things like that. And you, I think you looked at how many times a grade changed when we did our final celebrations mm-hmm. for a, um, one of our courses on, you know, integrate math one or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like, I think we could probably count on, I think I could probably count on one hand, how many times a grade actually was influenced, but yet thinking about the stress, the, the anxiety, the extra paperwork, everything that was put into those things. And I, you wonder like 
how could that be better used? You know, and, and again, these were like paper, pencil, Scantron, bubbling, you know, sort of things. Where it's like, you know, after all that's said and done, it was like, no one really hurt themselves. Very few helped themselves. Yeah. It was, was it what it was. And thinking, and I see the same thing at the university level where I've got, you know, people that are getting ill from anxiety and stress because of all these finals that they have and think about how can we help them do things so so when i do my celebrations it's a lot of it is portfolio based and i want to see hey show me something that a growth area it doesn't have to be something you did perfectly but something that you learned about how to do this job of teaching of in this case elementary mathematics better and the, the and it truly is a celebration you see like boom growth after growth and not only is it an uh where they get to reflect and see how they're growing as teachers. Also for me, I get to see that was a good assignment. That was a good reading that, you know, like these patterns of like, we tried, I tried an experiment this year of getting of different ways for having my elementary math teachers teach some math. They taught to small groups virtually in breakout rooms within zoom. And it's first time I did it. And I would say the majority of the folks put their little lesson, their mini lesson plans and the reflections they did afterwards and the evaluation process that we did around it, where they self-evaluated, they peer evaluated each other. That whole thing was the majority of our folks artifacts for like, that's where I grew the most is through that experience. And it was like, all right, that's a good, that's, that's a good thing to know versus if I would have done a, a Scantron of the concepts from the course, I don't know if I would have, we, Right. One, we would, what do we have gotten out of that situation versus what we did? And they got to become reflective practitioners, which is what we want our teachers to do. So that's a big tangent for me. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I, I, I love, I love it, Joel, when you go into that, because you, you just think deeply about it and, and you push and, and your willingness again, to come back to that, trying new things and pushing your elementary teachers and what you've learned from that, you're going to apply next semester and next year you teach this course. Well, I, and I know I, I'm trying to be uh, be good about our time here. And I, I didn't didn't know if you had another one that was on top of your mind, but I want to kind of ask what's what are you doing? What's the best thing you're doing in your role in education right now? But I don't know if you had anything else or you ready to move on. Uh, I think the third one we kind of covered is just the collaboration piece of it um, and how to do that yeah. efficiently, but how to use that well. Um, I, I learned a lot from you and I still utilize that in meetings, both with departments and meetings with other administrators. Yeah. Anything, and you know, one thing is uh, Shane and I still meet in quotation marks every Thursday morning. We used to do it uh, for uh, breakfast at, at the Eagle Inn uh, where I'd get the Eagle Inn sandwich, which is the greatest fried egg sandwich in the world. Um, and uh, we would do that. And then when I moved away, we still, uh, we uh, still meet uh, via the phone, but I think having that person that you can talk to that is, you know, to connect with on a personal basis, but then also connect with on a professional basis is really important. And to always have, I think, always have somebody in that role for you is, I think, pretty healthy, you know, especially in the world of education, where it's not just an investment of time, it's an investment of, I think, your soul, too, you know, uh, it's pretty, pretty important. But Shane, you're in your role as a assistant principal at Sockbury High School. What is the best thing you're doing in that role in education right now? Yeah, right now I think I think honestly the best thing is is trying to set things up for other people to knock it out of the park. Um, trying to let our teachers and our teacher leaders thrive. Um, uh, we're going through a, a standards grading assessment, uh, our standards grading pilot right now, and there are ways that I want to do it, but I'm not the one in the classroom living it and doing it, and so. Mm to be top down versus giving it to them and providing the resources and trying to do the leg work and trying to do grunt work on, on, on those pieces and being there to, to listen um, when things don't go well, but letting them thrive. So seeing their strengths, um, letting those shine and then helping to grow weaknesses. Uh, I think that's, that's the most uh, exciting thing for me right now, which is a step back because you want to be out front. You want to do those things. How can you to get the most satisfaction out of watching others grow um, has been has been a lot of fun. Kind of sounds like our math teaching experience, mm -hmm. you know, is yeah, like, really? yeah, try. I mean, and that's I think has been the, the coolest thing is seeing how you're basically creating the environment for these teachers to thrive and succeed and grow. And you're using your role as in, in 
creating space for that to happen, right? To, to make, you know, hey, oh, you need, you need some, uh, some resources, here we go. You need some, uh, some research on that, here we go. You need, what else do you need? You need some, some time? Okay, I can see if I can do that. Like trying to do those sorts of things. And, and then, and then, and then, trying to be out front in the right moments too. When, right. when someone comes in and, and, and something didn't go well, or a parent comes in, to be there to defend and to be able to work through it with that person or with the with a family. Um, that's the other part of my role. Then is to is to help them and then to circle back and say, okay, what happened? How can yeah. we move forward from here? Yeah, I, to to know that you've you've got their back. Right? I, that's I think that's a that's kind of amazing too. Um, we had a, a former guest on the the podcast, Tom Andres. I think uh, I didn't have him as a principal for except what was it for a couple months? I think couple one months, time, yeah. yeah, a couple months, and still like seeing the kinds of leadership that he did. I think there's uh, probably a lot of that within uh, within your own leadership as well. Like seeing those kind of things that he would back you up or offer some sort of insight. Um, I don't know. I know you. Tom was your basketball coach too, right? He was my basketball coach, yeah, and and a person that many would would point to as impacting life uh, deeply and uh, just a, a master educator. Um, uh, and and the things that I tried to you know little pieces even as administrator I, of 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 seeing that servant leadership uh, lived out both in public and in private. Um, you know, to the degree of, of watching him, I, I just have it burned in my mind as a, as both a teacher and that of, of watching him walk down a hall, not knowing anybody was behind him and picking up every piece of garbage that he might see in there. There was no benefit to it from him other than a clean school and his, no one was going to see it. No one was going to give him credit for it. Mm-hmm. He just did it. And, and little things like that and how he worked with people, how he honored people, uh, all of those things. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, so what's, what's something you're working on? So like you're, you're, you know, trying to help and create environments for, you know, teachers to do some improvement and thinking about how best to move forward within the school, but what are you doing personally? How how are you trying to, how do you want to improve? Yeah, right now, and and Joel, this is something you do very well is providing feedback to teachers. Um, and, um, that's not something that I'm able to do as well as I'd like. And now with the virtual component of that, this has added a whole new layer of mm-hmm. how do you how do you help? And I don't want to use the word evaluate. How do you help a person grow in virtual teaching when I've never taught virtually? I've never had that opportunity to do that in a classroom. Yeah, I can provide some specific advice, but virtually it's a different ball game. And um, and so I'm I'm trying to immerse myself in in opportunities to learn how to do this and and what are the experiences as as we go through this you know really worldwide experiment right now yeah um how do we as quickly as we can grow and and become better because we've already made the determination we aren't ever not going to have a virtual class again in our high school we never had one that we offered before this time and i can't imagine that we will ever go back to not having them the paradigm has changed. Mm -hmm. And so as educators and particularly as leaders who weren't coming up through that system, we need to change and grow. The principles are the same, but the delivery has changed and some of the the rules around it have changed. And so how do we help our staff grow in that and our students and our families grow in that? Yeah. Like, yeah, that whole, like, I mean, even like when I think of a, a student that has to be out for something, you know, it's like, the the time of hey just check in with your group and check the note like hey no 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 there's there's a way that you can you can be involved like if you've got an internet connection we could, we're we're here for you and um yeah changing that whole paradigm is, is is and what does that mean now like what does that mean going forward you know hopefully when we get to normal times um but it's going to be it, it's going to be a new normal it is going to be a new normal um, and even even going back to that time you know when I talked about going to that teacher's classroom right we used to have our own space now that space is open. You know, mm-hmm. we never wanted a camera in there, much less to record, much less to have live somewhere else. And now we're doing that every day. Yeah. All the time. So uh, given that, what, what advice do you have for, and you could pick whatever group you want or do multiple future pre-service teachers, other teachers, principals, what advice? Yeah. And this isn't certainly uh, from me, but I'll give my spin on it is that is that in our, in our current time, whether you're a fresh teacher, whether you're a teacher with 20 years of experience, whether you're an administrator, um, uh, 
this is an um, this is a challenging time. I mean, no one will say otherwise. And how do we approach that challenge? Do we approach it negatively or positively? Do we approach it as an opportunity, or do we approach it as a negative? And and so working on that mindset of that this is truly an amazing time to be in education. There are opportunities that you have right now to affect change um, that are, are, that happen within such a short span, such a short cycle um, that never had before. And so my advice is be flexible, dive in, um, take what you learn from, from what you, you know, in your educational system growing up in high school, college, and in your previous teaching experience, take that, take the good, take the bad, but don't be stuck there. Don't be in that mindset where this is what we used to do, whether it's assessments, as we talked about before, whether it's group work, whether it's, um, uh, the communication between whether it's how assignments are even handed in um, is, is take that and now grow with it, run with it, um, see what other people are doing um, and, and, and beg, borrow and steal. But this is just a time where I think I think we're entering in to a five year or we are into a five year period that change will continue. But this is going to be one of those rapid periods of change where things are just exploding mm -hmm. and i've always wondered what it would be like to be in that time you know you can look back towards when america expanded or just a variety of times in history and think wow it must have been exciting no it's not <laughs> you know at some point it's a grind it's a struggle yeah. it's it's how are we going to do this but we're going to look back and and people like yourself in in university are going to look back and say what happened during that time period that radically changed how we, how we educate, how we teach, how we learn. Um, and, and there's going to be winners and losers from that piece. Okay. Now, Shane, just one more thing, um, which is, I mean, that, that perspective on what is this time going to mean? And I see like the creativity and the, the amount of like in, ingenuity and, and you're seeing it on, on the, yeah, I was, uh, you know, fortunate to get in on some conversations seeing about like what your teachers are doing at the school. And it's just the, the how people collaborated and rallied together and the things that they were doing. And I'm sure that they continue to do on a daily basis. And um, it's, it's exciting, exciting to be a part of. And so, you know, there, there is some different perspectives where there is a perspective like you can take on this. There's opportunities and challenges and yeah, it is a grind and it, you know, teaching has never not been a grind, but how do you, how do you approach it? So one thing, uh, final question. Oh, go ahead, Shane. I'm going to pause you. Just one one brief piece of advice, uh, regardless of those situations, is that, that I've come to realize: if you're an educator and you think and you are good at something, you need to think deliberately about the person who's opposite of you and who's not, and you need to seek out and try to help them. If there's any step you can take to make yourself a better educator, is to not just work with in your strengths, but to realize what what you weren't good at. Find that student, find that teacher if you're an administrator, seek that person out and help them um, and understand their point of view and you will become a much better teacher or administrator in a hurry. Sorry, I just wanted to get that. No, no, get that's that what, you know, I talk about this with uh, some of my doctoral students and like you're becoming a steward of the profession versus anyone who's in education. You are a steward of the profession. How do you steward? And so like, I guess, you know, here's the thing is that you and I and our collaboration, you know, and the, then that we got to share it, you're, you know, we're sharing it in different ways. We both presented together. We, you do things at, in, uh, within your professional organization, you do things at the school, obviously. But does your impact remain when you leave that class? When I left that classroom at Stockbury High School, I'd like to think that some of the influence might still remain, possibly, you know. Mm -hmm. you know or at least within our relationship, our professional relationship, or then, you know, how does that did I steward it well or versus if I would have just siloed myself and not shared anything and I just stayed in my classroom and I never went down the hall. As soon as I left, everything I took, everything would leave with me. Right. And so how do we uh, leave that impact uh, going forward? So that's, that's good. We need to, we need to have more of the, we need to have reach out just like we're creating environments for our students to do good things. We need to create environments for our schools and for our, our colleagues to do great things as well. And then vice versa, they're going to invest in us as well. So it's, it's awesome. Um, Cause I know, again, I've taken a lot of things from Sock Prey. I'm still thinking about some of those lessons that I've learned from you, from Tom, from uh, my co colleagues in the math department. It's been great. So 
what is the best thing you did or do to help your teaching? So this goes for someone, you've been in education a long time. So just to make sure that we haven't missed it. Mm-hmm. What is the best thing, Shane, that you did or do to help your teaching? I think, I think the two best things that I did is, is first of all, I, I, I realized, I reflected and realized who I am as a person, as an educator, and then try to work within that. Early in my career, I saw people like you, I saw uh, other people like Tom, and, the, and I tried to be them, or I tried to bring your energy or, or your pieces, and that wasn't me, it wasn't authentic. And when I'm not authentic, then people can see through that. Yeah. Even a ninth grade struggling math student can see through that. So be who you are because you've been created in a unique way and you will reach people when you live within who you truly are. Now you're not perfect. So grow within that. Right. But don't, don't, don't try to be somebody else because you see what they do. Be who you are, incorporate successful aspects into that. And then that you'll blossom within that. And, and people will do that. And then the relational piece of it is, is my guiding quote is people just don't care um, what you know until they know how much you care. And I know that's an old quote, but that, I think that just goes everywhere on this. And when I realized that, my relationship with students and with staff changed, um, that they needed to know that I cared about them before they really cared about what I knew about math or what I knew about teaching. I could still get through to kids. I was still a good enough teacher to get through to them. But when I realized that relations really form the core of this, that that alongside of teaching within who I am while expanding that transformed who I was as a teacher. Yeah. One of my students this past semester, we were talking about a philosophy statement. She said it two words, relationships matter. Like that's her philosophy. It's just like relationships matter. And I just, I, when I think I, when I heard her say that, and I thought of you, Shane, and just, you know, like thinking about what you taught me with you know, it's not about the techniques. It's not about the being fancy with, you know, different strategies and things, but just the fact that they're the number one assessment I saw is when like in the morning, when, you know, the school's not in session yet, your class was already full because people wanted to be in there. They wanted to see what Mr. Sh- Mr. Bean was doing, which interfered with you grading and all that, but still the investment of those relationships was paid off. And I, I remember even too, like you had a student that no chance of passing was definitely gonna be going back. And like, but still, I think the kid enjoyed the class and, and you made the comment. I believe you made the comment. I, I, I true to this to you. It's like, you're just saying, you know what? I still need to, inv-. like, yeah, it, it upsets me that he's not doing the work, but I need to invest this relationship because he's going to be in my room again next year. And hopefully then he's ready for the math relationship. I'm going to build this relationship so the math relationship can come. And it's like, it was one of those things where, yeah, I mean, you really put that, as something where the relationship with this, not only with the kids, but with the communities, with the family, with, I mean, I know you can't even go to the grocery store without taking less than a half an hour. There's no just running in for milk for Shane Bean. So uh, in the local grocery store, but that, that just a testament to the, your belief in that the relationships matter. And that, that really, that means a lot to me. And I, hopefully it means a lot to all those educators out there who might be listening. And relations and having a relationship doesn't mean you can't have high expectations. Those two things can work together. Um, sometimes that's a that's a disconnect there. Those two things can come together. You don't have to be easy to still have relationships with people. Right. Yeah. No, that's perfect. That's in there. All right, <laughs> Shane. So thank you so much for uh, joining me on this episode. I appreciate your time. And uh, thank you on all you out there for listening to this episode of the Amazon Planet Podcast. Show notes for uh, this episode can be found at amadonplanet.com forward slash episode 38. We'll reference some of our uh, episodes that we uh, mentioned here. And if you're looking for ways to support, you can subscribe, rate, review. You can go to Facebook and uh, like it there, uh, like the Facebook page. You can uh, subscribe to the Amadon Planet download, which you can find uh, links to at amadonplanet.com. You can check out the Amadon Planet store, Amadon Planet bookshop. Any of those purchases support the podcast. So thank you again for listening. Thanks to Shane for sharing his time and expertise. Thanks to Matt Mifflin for the music in this episode. He's got a new single, by the way. Check it out on Spotify uh, under his new album. And finally, thank you to all of you out there who are seeking to teach better and be the good in the world by investing in the lives of others. This world is a better place because you have decided to use the gifts you have been given to serve others. Thank you for all that you do. Peace. Peace.